Prime Minister in Nigeria. She has also gone into history as the first and only to date female president of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC. She is here today as a worthy daughter of the Ijo Nation. It is therefore my honor and privilege to invite Dr. Mrs. Diazani Alison Madwike to the virtual podium for her presentation. You are most welcome, ma'am. Thank you. Your Excellency, Dr. Goodluck Ibele Jonathan, GCFR, former President, Federal Republic of Nigeria, and my former boss, our revered and most respected elder statesman of the Ijo Nation, and my own dear great uncle, Chief E.K. Clark. The Ijo Nation Development Group and IWC Worldwide, my dear brothers and sisters. Before I start my lecture, I want to very quickly acknowledge what um, my dear great uncle, Chief E.K. Clark has said because indeed we have to take our destiny in our own hands. Nobody will do it for us. And in saying that, I want to remember and acknowledge the support that President Goodluck Jonathan gave to me and others amongst us under his tenure in order for us to put in place various advancements for our nation, and we did. I recall a number of rounds of scholarships given through PTDF to our people and others in Nigeria as well. In transportation, the same was done. I recall the NNPC GMs twice positioned with various mandates. Executive directors from NNPC twice positioned, in fact, the powerful NPDC had its MD from the Niger Delta as well. These were all put in place during our time, along with other positions that we tried to give equitably to all Nigerians. But we were very well aware that we needed to ensure that our people began to stand and began to get a certain amount of understanding and knowledge and education in that all important sector of petroleum. And it was done very logically. Implementation, of course, is always a different issue. And this brings me back to what my great uncle was saying. Our destiny is in our hands. When we are given opportunities, we should not only take them, but we should use them and use them well for the betterment of our people. And that goes all the way down the line. You cannot do it alone at the top. Everybody must take that responsibility. And we must be particularly judicious about it at this moment in time as we go forward. And so I will come now to the lecture at hand. It is indeed a privilege to speak to you this evening on the void of fatherhood. Where are the Ijome? The void of fatherhood and the constituent predicament that it unleashes on those that it touches and tarnishes is a very well-documented travesty throughout the world and through time. It has happened in every corner of the earth and it happens all over Nigeria as well. Fortunately, it seems to have occurred in much greater clusters and numbers amongst black men for some reason, particularly in the Americas and the Caribbean. And we are now seeing that this negative trend is also becoming a major pariah across our Ijo nation. Up until 20 or 30 years ago, an Ijo man was generally seen as the focal rallying point of his home and by implication, his community. He carried himself with a certain pride, pride in his home, pride in his culture, pride in his traditions. It is true that our Ijo women were and are very strong women. They have always been so. And over the last 100 years and more, we, the Ijo women, have looked after our homes and taken care of our children. Our women paddled their canoes 
across rivers to their farms on the other side. They planted and harvested their crops to feed their families and they paddled home again. Yet, even with all that, our Ijo men who were primarily hunters and fishermen were still the central strength of their families. In our days, growing up, the voice of the father in the home was that of authority. He instituted in his children hard work, strong morals, good manners, respect for elders, respect for rules, and respect for regulations. The father could not be in any way disrespected or ignored. A father was a voice of reason, of advice, and of knowledge. I grew up in a home like this. My father was a strong Ijo man with a calm but authoritative voice and manner about his person. I am the person that I am today because of the solid home base that my parents provided. You will recall, all of you, that in the old days, when our grandfathers and ancestors had three or four wives, even though there were clearly inherent problems that appertain with polygamous marital arrangements, however, the men were still not missing in action. They still functioned as the focal points of their families. What we are seeing now in the Ijo nation is a total breakdown of our family structures, a complete fragmentation of the old order. And this new order that we are bringing in is a very poor and precarious replacement. A large percentage of our Ijo men are now what I can only describe as sexually nomadic by choice. They habitually leave their primary wives and families and set up ancillary liaisons with other women. They live and procreate with these other women and then sometimes move on again to even others. What is even more disturbing is that in many of these cases, they are not even providing financial support, not to mention moral and emotional support to the ones that they have left behind. Let me try and put the impact of absentee fathers in the right context. Let us look at global studies. In the United Nations, in the United States rather, a 2015 census showed that about 50% of African American boys, that's black American boys under the age of 18, live only with their mothers and are being brought up solely by their mothers. Research has shown us that these children in fatherless homes are more likely than others to drop out of school, exhibit behavioral problems, end up in jail, suffer unemployment, and are at a greater risk of substance, alcohol, and drug abuse than their counterparts in stable home environments. The implications of fatherless homes are incredible. The former US president, George W. Bush, even addressed the issue while he was in office, stating, I quote, over the past four decades, fatherlessness has emerged as one of our greatest social problems. He was referring to the United States. We know that children who grow up with absent fathers can suffer lasting damage. They are more likely to end up in poverty, drop out of school, become addicted to drugs, have a child out of wedlock, or end up in prison. Fatherlessness is not the only cause of these things, but our nation, of course he was talking about the US, must recognize that it is an important factor, unquote. Narratively speaking, many individuals can attest to the fact that the lasting impact of a father in a child's life cannot be denied. Many would admit that they have struggled with feelings of abandonment and low self-esteem due to the lack of a father's love in their lives. In a nutshell, the problems created by fatherless homes are myriad and they run the gamut from health problems to mental health issues and to adverse effects on future relationships. Fatherless children tend to enter romantic, romantic partnerships earlier than others. They are more likely to divorce or dissolve their cohabitation or cohabitating unions 
and they are more likely to have children outside marriage or outside any partnership at all. In Ijaw land today, there is an alarming <coughs> growing trend in the number of absentee fathers. So let us bring this discussion down home to Nigeria, as this problem, as I said, occurs in other parts of Nigeria as well. And in particular, to our own Ijaw nation, where we are seeing these similar heartbreaking trends of absentee fathers and the devastating effects to our children, the mothers, to the home, to the community, and to our society. Too many of our young men are on the streets looking for ways to make fast cash, disregarding the rigor of hard work. This is probably because many of our boys are growing out, up without a central male figure that they can look up to, that they can bond with, and that they can emulate. So inevitably, they are forced to look outside the home for a substitute father role model. And nine times out of 10, because of their age and their vulnerability and their circumstance, that substitute role model that they turn to will be the wrong one. The ones that have swag, the yahoo yahoo boys, as my son would say. These, in short, are the role models that they are looking at. These are the ones who reinforce negative societal behaviors and values. This is a travesty of an unfolding tragedy for us. Why have I spent the time talking about fatherless homes and the impact that it has on our children? Well, the truth of the matter is that an irresponsible boy tends to become an irresponsible man. And it is therefore a vicious cycle. If you plant cocoyam, you cannot harvest plantain. It affects not only our homes and our culture, our cultural and traditional values and structure, but it permeates the very strength of our regional economy as well. The consistent hard work and mental vigor needed to build a solid regional economic base in the Niger Delta becomes completely eroded. And once our economic base is eroded, we become, as a group, less significant in relation to our country's national discourse. There are no shortcuts to working your way up the ladder of life. Progressing in life, in work, and in relationships, marital or otherwise, is always dependent on consistent effort and on hard work. As we create more responsible young men and women, we will generate, we will generate more responsible fathers which in turn will engender a more sustainable society and build a greater nation of successful Ijo men and women. And to do this, we need to go back to the fundamentals. We need to focus inwards and recreate the strong family bonds centered around a physically involved and socially present father. This will help to rebuild our Ijo nation up once again, starting from the core bedrock of reconstituted, solid, incontrovertible family values. In doing this, we should note that a father is not defined as the man who makes the child. Any man can make children, frankly. It does not take brains to pregnant a woman. It is the man who extends his hands and his time to help with the child being raised and gives his heart to love the child through anything. That is a father. Blood does not always make you a dad or a father. Like I said, anybody can make a child. Raising and caring for a child is what real parents do. And as a community, all of us, if we as the Ijo nation intend to ensure our indelible progressive longevity and to hold on to our rich cultural heritage, 
Then we all have an intrinsic responsibility to ensure the focused parenting of our future generations. In the end, it is our culture, the totality of the pattern of behavior of the Ijo peoples that marks us out distinctively from other societies. Let me point out that coming from a fatherless home does not always of itself necessarily create negative outcomes. No, not at all. There are many examples of well-known national and global figures and also of not so well-known people who came from fatherless homes and sometimes from both fatherless and motherless homes who have actually done very well from them, for themselves in the struggle of life. President Obama and President Bill Clinton of the United States of America, they both grew up in fatherless homes. The world-renowned Hollywood actor, Eddie Murphy, was raised solely by his mother. There are many examples of this. There are also a number of noteworthy Nigerians who were raised by their mothers and grandmothers, and they have done very well for themselves. However, these are exceptional cases. They are not necessarily the norm. It also has to be strongly noted that many single mothers have worked amazingly hard to raise notable and successful children in the Ijo nation, in Nigeria, and in the world as a whole. Now at this juncture, I would like to speak for a few moments to my Ijo woman, because I have only about 22 minutes or 23 to speak. As I said earlier, our Ijo women have always been strong women, physically and emotionally, from time immemorial. I would like to drive home the fact that women, given the right tools and backing, can make significant socioeconomic differences to their society, to their community, and to their nation. They can be and have been the role models that young men, and of course young women, can look up to, to drive their own aspirations and their own commitment to hard work. I want to stress that no woman is helpless, not to talk of our hardworking Ijo women who are multidimensional in every sense of the word. Regarding economic empowerment for women, the United Nations has posited that when more women work, economies grow. Women's economic empowerment boosts productivity. It increases economic diversification and income equality, in addition to other positive development outcomes. Also, it should be noted that women's economic equality is good for business. In studies, worldwide studies, companies have been found to greatly benefit from increasing employment and leadership opportunities for women, which is shown to increase organizational effectiveness and growth. This is very well documented. Politics is another area in which women are proven to excel. It is quite striking for me, a study I found which was done in India and published by the Brookings Institute on women legislators and economic performance. In its conclusion, that study posited that women legislators are more effective relative to men at producing economic growth in less developed countries. His Excellency, our own Dr. Goodluck Jonathan, achieved a remarkable near 40% ratio of women to men in his cabinet during his time in office. While we look forward to seeing these sort of ratios again in the not too distant future, as women, we need to prepare ourselves at every level for entry into the political sphere. Let us start with the grassroots, the grassroots level, and find platforms for Ijo women to get their voices heard and to contribute actively to the political discourse in our land. 
for our women, our women to be part of the conversation and not just receivers. For our women to have a say in what projects are executed in Ijo land, how those projects are executed and where those projects are executed. The more of our women that are involved in active politics, and in fact, the more women that are involved in politics throughout our nation of Nigeria, the more we will begin to see a better enabling environment for women to contribute to the development of their society, to the development of their sons and daughters, irrespective of the presence or lack thereof of a father figure. In conclusion, let me state, that the idea of a rebirth of the Ijo nation is indeed provoking and necessary. As Ijo, his own people, we understand the situation in our region. While our resources form the bedrock of the nation's wealth, in terms of educational and economic wherewithal, we remain in many ways emaciated in terms of the development of our economic and infrastructural fortunes. I am therefore ending my discourse by putting before the Ijo nation these pertinent questions for us all to take time and think about. How can we change this narrative? How do we reverse these trends? How do we get our people, both men and women, on the right economic progressive paths at whatever level they may currently be on and ensure that they are able to celebrate their God-given talents and gifts? How do we reach our single mothers who may not be tapped into the resources available for their sons and their daughters? And how do we support them in their struggle to survive and see our sons and daughters in Ijo land begin to thrive? How do we create a society of emotionally healthy men, and by implication, women, despite this growing pandemic of absentee fathers that we are seeing. Because the skills and the talents of these our young sons and daughters are needed for a better world. My brothers and sisters, there is a dire need for a complete change of mindset. We need to refocus, re-strategize, and re-energize ourselves into a viable contender and member of the committee of nations or tribes that sit at the table of national discourse and that have the necessary prowess to be taken very seriously at that table. I sincerely hope that this conference forms the catalyst or springboard that will begin to turn this story around. What I have spoken of here is just the beginning. It is just the start of the discourse. In the short time that I have had here, I cannot even begin to cover the magnitude and ramifications of this issue. And the consequent as well as consequential imperatives for our immediate, short-term, medium-term, and long-term reconcilable solutions to this. I would humbly suggest that as an immediate fallout of this discourse, a serious in-depth workshop is convened as soon as possible with the requisite skilled enablers put in place. A workshop that creates a platform for the issue to be pulled apart and dealt with in an extremely comprehensive manner. A workshop or series of workshops that gives our young men and women the requisite advice and direction that will help them get their feet on the ladder of economic and political empowerment. The output of such a workshop or workshops should be it should be a step-by-step, -step, simple, concise, and implementable plan or plans broken down into manageable sections 
with implementation timelines and guidelines. A plan or plans that can be easily put into action in our region, in our communities, and in our homes. As our great uncle E.K. Clark said during his speak, speech, our destiny is indeed in our own hands. My brothers and sisters, it has been a privilege to speak to you. I thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Dizani Alice Madiki. That was a well studied and presented um, lecture, and we are so glad that you made it. Um, we're just going to go into the questions and answer session, but before we do that, I'd like to give the panelists one minute each, please. One minute, because we're really, um, our time is fast spent. One minute each to share your thoughts on the topic. I will start with the ladies. So, um, Mommy Daba, please share um, your thoughts. Yes. Okay, um, I, because we don't have much time, I was afraid of that. I would like to greet uh, our president, uh, President Goodluck of the village, Jonathan GFRC, and my daddy, Edwin Clark. I always call him chief. And also my former boss, Dr. Mrs. Desani Allison, who appointed me GM, executive director before um, we, we, she left. However, um, we have just one minute to, or we have another a few more minutes to, to talk about what she has said. A wonderful paper, I would say. Um, but I, I said that I have jotted down a lot of uh, points, which in a, in a way um, seems to al be aligned what she has said. So if you want me to just say uh, one minute, one minute is a bit too small to, to, to uh, air my mind. But then I said for one, what, who is a father? A father is described. I will just go, you know, uh, give a synopsis of what I, I have jotted down. So a father is known for who he is, a parent, a male parent. Uh, the, presumably, the paper is to discuss the causes of lack of progress, development, education, um, increased restiveness, militancy, skewers. Yes, and she dealt with that very effectively. Again, I also see a myriad of causes why this is happening in the community. Uh, curiously, I would like to say, who is a German? Who is he? I see him as an existentialist. Uh, for now, in the past, the German was different. Perhaps when we were growing up, I had a father that was very strict. But in recent times, who is he? He's a Republican thinker, I think, who thinks of himself more than anybody else, and he's, uh, he's in, the, in the community that he comes from. But when you take him, when you look at that, he diminishes his posture as a leader in the home, because a leader at home would automatically become a leader in the community which we are lacking in a joint nation. And I would say that we need to imbibe the Mbutu philosophy, which says that I am because you are. And that topic is dealt in most of the talks here because the German is for self first. We need to be more cohesive. I see a debt of, of leadership in the Ijo nation. First, I would say there is lack of traditional leadership. There is lack of economic leadership. There is lack of social leadership. There is lack of political leadership. So when you have these four leader, cardinal leaderships in a community, what do you have? You have fragmentation. And so, um, but I must be quick to tell you that in recent times, I have seen a paradigm shift to re-recognize and energize the the uh, traditional leadership in, in, on ancient stools. However, the other two very important leaderships of economics and politics sees a Herculean task in the community because 
The, the, that is because the, the, the average a German lacks the prerequisite that makes a leader. So what do you have when you have, you don't have economic leadership as well as um, political leadership? That you can't go to war without, without a, a, a general. And so the nation is thrown into the national gallery without a leader. And since you gave me one minute, I would also tell you that when we have, when you don't have a traditional leadership, what do you have? It gives you eroded authority in the community. If you lack economic leadership, what would you have? It will, it will deprive the young nation sound mind and strategic thinkers. If you lack political leadership, what would you have? It will spew out on censored political, what I will call gladiators. And if you have, if you lack social leadership, what would you have? It will hide the best minds in the Ijo nation. So that is what the problem, one of the problems I see. The other regions have their own problems, but if something happens to anybody, they run to their MS, they run to their KVACs, and they run to their obese. The young man stands naked in the market square because he has nobody to run to because we have not built the, the structure of leadership. Eleanor Roosevelt, one time American first lady says, nobody can insult you without your permission. In Nigeria, in the sphere of Nigeria, we make the money, the money, the, the resources come from our place. What do we have? We don't have anything. We don't have anything, why? because we are fragmented. I'm, you are looking at your time, I know that, but that uh, puts me off a little bit. Um, and I would say that the other challenges for the Ijoman in the home is the type of marriages that we have. They are quite discriminative, multiple styles of marriages. There is one they call Egwa, where a woman bears children for a man in her parents' home and the children grew up there. For a, a woman who is living with her parents, of course she can get pregnant for another man very easily. And the man who is an absentee father that does not take responsibility financially or otherwise has no moral standing to say what she should do or what she should not do. He cannot even discipline his own daughters because, I mean, that is the setting that there is, you know. So they do what they want to do. And you find out that the, the children grow up within the, 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 uh, the setting without a father. So that also gives us a weak, a very weak, weak family structure. And you have, when you have a weak family structure, it is very difficult for you to have the kinds of uh, male visibility that you would have in other homes. Um, in, I'm, I'm coming, I'm, is very, I'm very, I'm very is, um, close to conclusion now. Another thing that I want to skate through here because of lack of time. Who is the German? What is his faith? Is he a Christian? Is he a heathen? Is he a Muslim? Or is he a traditionalist? Besides the faith, what is his pedigree? Is he a fisherman, a farmer, a trader, a warrior, a nomad? The substance of a man must combine strong spirituality and pedigree. There is need to find out who he is for us to know where he, he, he is. If we don't know who he is, obviously we cannot find where he is. <laughs> he is a minority, again, is no longer an argument because the Tutsis and the Fulanis rule wherever they are so that we are minority in where we, in the in the sphere of Nigeria is no longer the reason why we cannot be at the top of things. Um, my suggestions: the German should aspire to create living legends and selfless heroes. We must aspire to to have a synergic effort to learn and cultivate leadership qualities. We must imbibe the Mbutu philosophy that I am because you are. Minimize diversive and discriminative cultures, which I think is very prominent in our, in our structure, family structure. I would say that the qualities of, of the citizen reflects 
on the community. This is to compress what I have, I, my, my mind, my, my talking points, but I've just compressed it, you know. I was hoping that we would have enough time to, to, to go through in-depth uh, analysis of, of this very important topic. But I'm very happy that the presenter did a fantastic job and it was very well presented. But I would have loved to have support of what uh, a more uh, valuable support for what she has said. So do I have more time? <laughs> I see you looking at your time. I'm sorry, unfortunately, you do not have more time. Um, okay. have to, thank you very much. Thank you. You have raised some real valid points. Um, but we have to quickly move to um, Dr. Stephen Benstow. Please share your thoughts. And I hope that you do better with time. Um, one Than minute. Me. <laughs> well, one minute, sir. Thank you so much. And I thank uh, the organizers of this uh, program. Um, I thank President Jonathan for uh, finding time to speak to job people is an inspiration for us. I thank uh, Chief UK Clark, who has been a father in, in politics and national discourse. Our dear sister, Diziani, it's nice to see you. Um, you have really inspired the women, I'll tell you right away, um, you know, on this occasion. Um, I, will, um, I will say one thing before I go. For Dr. Jonathan, Dr. Jonathan is an institution for the job people. And I want to suggest we make Dr. Jonathan an EJO institution because it helps, it will help us to, 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 to support our thinking. It will help us to rally around whatever we do in this country. So please, Dr. Jonathan, I want us to make you an EJO institution. Now, going back to what um, our sister has said, yes, uh, she has talked so much about the lack of uh, influence of the father in raising the children in Niger land. Um, yes, it's an admonition of, uh, of, of we as fathers of Niger, but uh, the way forward is what we need to have. I, um, because of time, I want to say directly that current Niger fathers protect the future of your children, participate in what they do, for instance, we have the IYC, which is uh, an IJO group, IJO youth organization. How many of us are really participating in the thinking of these uh, young people? It is very important that we should go into their mindset and find out what these young people do. Today, IJO uh, IYC, they just conducted an election and um, I hope it will be a stable election this time. It will be a stable a job, a job youth organization this time. Because what I want us to speak to the minds of these young people is the quick attitude towards making a fortune. It has, it has derided the thinking of a job. It has made us look in the eyes of Nigerians as rascals. It is only when we organize our youth become very recognized in the system. Because like E.K. Clark, uh, e. Clark said, yeah, he is on the verge of living, but we don't want him to live now. But the use that he's living this world for, what are we doing to uh, put the name of Ijo's on the map of Nigeria? Okay, Ijo youths are so disorganized, maybe because of this lack of uh, parental care, lack of fatherhood in the system. So I will seriously talk to our Ijo uh, fathers to put some presence in our youth. Now, the suggestion by our, our sister that we organize this more in a workshop is well welcome uh, because time will not permit us now to actually go into the nitty gritty of her speech, but her suggestions that uh, the final conclusions of her speech is very important to us. So, uh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to be where I am. But for those of you who are, please let us have some presence in the lives of our children, especially the male child. And I commend the uh, uh, women folk as well, who most times have been um, um, saddled with raising these kids without their fathers. 
you have been doing a good job. Again, they say when you train a girl child, you train a nation. So we need to be focused on our girl children and our wives and our sisters so they can continue to be encouraged to raise good young men. Uh, for lack of time, I don't want to speak too much anymore. I will yield my time to the moderator at this time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, if you have used that, oh, uh, please. Um, there's some interference. Please, could you take care of that? Thank you very much, Dr. Bensto. Um, I'd like at this point to invite um, Sister Debbie to share her thoughts before we take that of High Chief Kentebe. Debbie? Okay. Um, she's not here. So, Hi, Chief Kentebe, please, one minute to share your thoughts. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Your Excellency, former President, uh, good luck, Jonathan, uh, Father Park Clark, our boss, uh, our sister, and my former boss, Mrs. Dizani Alison Madweke, um, all other protocols observed. Well, this is a topic that is very dear to my heart, and I am very happy that uh, justice has been done to it today. But like she mentioned, I think we need to, and Steve also mentioned, we need to take this on more seriously at a workshop, a full day workshop to dissect. A lot. I, I was reading the uh, comments and there were various comments to say, well, fatherhood is not the cause of the problem in Niger land. You know, other people don't have fathers, they succeed. But let's look at this and see how it affects the future of Niger people. We, in 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 in, in the last uh, 20, 30 years ago, there used to be discipline. There used to be a lot of moral values. All those things have eroded. And I believe that these have eroded because we don't have father figures, not necessarily a physical person or physical human being in a place or in a room, but someone that can act as a role model, someone the children of today can look up to. I am very glad that in our discourse today, some people have also suggested that we look at our uh, brother, our leader, the former president, as someone to begin to emulate both in words, thoughts, and deed. And that is a welcoming thing because five years ago, all we talked about were Adakaboro, Dapabrie, and others. What happened between that time and now, where we do not have, where we, we could not fill the gap of great Ijom men who have lived within that time? Somebody needs to step up to the plate. We have seen someone we can latch onto. Let us begin to think in that direction. Mothers are naturally nurturers. We're not going to take that away from them. But fathers are there to pro protect and provide for the family. In Ijolan today, what I see is lacking, really, are the values that we used to have in yesteryears. You know, also, the person that gave birth to you wasn't necessarily the only one you called your father. There was discipline. When you stepped out of your house and you saw other men, your uncles, your father's brothers, your cousins who are older than you, they were like role models and fathers to you. In Ijolan today, all that is gone. And people just look at you and feel, well, I'm a man at 17 years old. I'm a man at 16 years old because I can impregnate a girl. And they don't know what that means. Or they don't know what the impl implications of that will be. When they do that, they just walk away. They don't have any sense of responsibility. And this has greatly affected the values and morals of us in Ijoland. And I think we need to begin to look at that. And maybe, just maybe, if we go back to the old days, where we had that father figure, where we had that discipline, where we had that moral value. For people like Pawikezi, we had Governor Kilo, we had Ambassador Iyala, uh, Joe Iyala, Litigo Gary, uh, Arwell Difa, General Undiomu. They were all living in Lagos here. And when I saw them, I saw a father in them, not necessarily my own birth father. 
and this is what we need to go back to in Ijoland, where everybody gives respect to those that are older than them and they see them as father figures who can encourage and guide us to build a greater Ijo nation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, High Chief Kentebe. That was well delivered. Okay, so we would I don't know if we, let me ask your permission. Do we take one question from the participants before we wrap up? Yes, one question and then we have to wrap up because we were okay, to so, keep this so, within two hours, please. All right. The very first question that came in, Okay, let me get it. All right, okay. Somebody made a comment here, but let me go straight to a question. If we look in depth into our soul, a joy nation is in shallow, despite the huge allocation, Accrue to our land. How do we look inward to develop our land despite trillions we get through? Allocations to another. Okay, that's we can take another one instead. This is from Asha Bibi Benton. Which would you say is more debilitating challenge to women projecting themselves for leadership and politics? Lack of self-esteem, confidence, or absence of support for other women at some poses. Who would like to answer that question? Mommy Daba, could you um, answer that question? She's still online. Unmute yourself. Yes, I have. Okay. Yeah, you, you, can you recast the question? The question. What should you say is a more debilitating challenge to women projecting themselves for leadership and politics? Lack of self-esteem, confidence, or absence of support? Well, I, I, I disagree with him. I would disagree with him. Perhaps he's looking at it from the perspective mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. doorman who has very little respect for, for female you know, womanhood because I do not think that a young woman has, uh, is, does not respect herself or has low self-esteem. I, I, I totally agree with, disagree with him. As a matter of fact, in my paper, I was, um, uh, I was saying that the job woman right now, the amnesty program should focus more on the job woman who has the grueling uh, responsibility to bring up the next sets of a job men in future. So because the, the, the militants are sleeping with women and breeding children. So, and the children are left with the mothers. So if we face more, if we put more emphasis and, uh, you know, uh, more, uh, empowerment to the women, it will bring further in the future more responsible Ijo men than what we have right now. So I do not think that Ijo woman has no self-esteem. I, I disagree. Thank you very oh, much. Hmm. Okay. Does somebody want to add any thoughts on that? Yes, um, you know, um, I, I, I sign up with her that uh, Ijo women are not uh, low, does not have low self-esteem. What is actually uh, happening is um, the main folks who had dominated, in especially the political sphere, you know, usually don't give them the room. But I don't know, again, how they can take advantage of the room or the space, the political space, if not, um, like what E.K. Uh, e. Class said, your destiny, we take our own development and destiny into our hands. So I will encourage the job women who are into politics to also take advantage of the situation and plunge themselves into the political divide. Or even in economic uh, 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 struggles, you know, make sure they're always there and show interest in what they do instead of uh, trying to lag behind. 
but we main folks should give them the opportunity and support because when they develop the children develops thank you thank you very much i think we will we, we'll come to the end of this session with that um response we cannot take any more questions thank you our panelists you have done very well Thank you, our uh, guest speaker, Dr. Desani Alison Madrike. Your paper was absolutely on point, and a lot of people have requested for it. And I'm sure that we will share this um, the presentation to the emails of all those who have registered. So we'll go straight to the next item, which is a vote of thanks. And I invite Mrs. Ilim Seminitari to make the closing remarks and deliver the vote of thanks. Your Excellency, the um, former president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, His Excellency Dr. Goodluck Ebele Jonathan GCFR, very distinguished Royal Majesties, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think we've had a very, very thought provoking session. And one of the biggest things that has come out of this is the need for united voice. But it's also been a lot of introspection and we've looked at those areas we need to strengthen. Definitely the issue of a role model stands out. And we're privileged and blessed that one of us has held the highest office of the land. He didn't just hold that office, he acquitted himself creditably. And so we can hold our heads high as people of Ijo land. Your Excellency, we are deeply grateful to have you and we're very privileged to have you chair the very first of all of these sessions. It is an honor for all of us, and we are thankful that we can continue to drink from your well of wisdom. Our father, Father Edwin Clark, who is always available, always there. I don't know what words to use to describe you, sir, but we are thankful that God has left you here for us. We continue to thank God for your life, and we trust that you will be with us for a very long time. Because every time you speak, we're deeply, deeply blessed. My dear brothers, my sisters, all of the contributors, the panelists, everyone has had us thinking. Thank you so much, former Honorable Minister of Petroleum, Dizani, because you spoke those words from a place of depth, from a place of passion. And I think that you truly have left some strong statements in our minds. Indeed, we ask a big question of where are the fathers? And that's a critical question and I hope we all go home thinking about it. It's been a long day, but it's been a day worthwhile. To all of the conveners, to all of our various leaders of our various groups, we ask that God bless you and God keep you. And I hope we're all ready again because the next session is happening next week. And then we're going to look at the mothers. The women have always been critical to our economic development and our social life in Ijoland. And so I hope you've registered for that webinar and I hope we all come back again together as we deliberate on that. And then we will go further and look at other things. Let me again thank everyone and say that it's been my privilege to really be able to say thank you. Thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Seminatari. And on that note, we come to a close of today's event. See you on Sunday by 5 p.m. God bless you all. Thank you for coming. Bye.